the deformation mechanisms of polymers are even more unusual, right? So polymers, let's start with a semi-crystalline polymer. So it's got big blocks of crystalline, and then in, interspersed you've got these amorphous regions. So you can see that here. These are the big blocks of crystalline, and then you've got these amorphous regions between them, right? So what's going to happen as you start to deform this, right? Well, there's a number of steps that occur, right? These occur in different steps as you plastically deform this polymer. The first step is going to be elongation of these amorphous regions. So these amorphous regions, they there wasn't much holding them together, not like crystalline materials where van der Waals forces are holding these bonds together. Um, and so those are going to be the first things that elongate. Now the next thing that's going to happen, step three, your lamella, which used to be stacked like this in your crystalline regions, are now going to align themselves like that. So they have to deform a little bit to line up like that, um, but they're still crystalline. The next step as you continue deforming a polymer is those big crystalline blocks start to break up. See these different chunks? Now it's broken up into pieces there. And finally, if you keep on deforming it, then you get complete orientation of all these different chunks and amorphous regions, right? So it's clear that during this process, you're losing some crystallinity and you are orienting your polymer. So it's getting stronger by orienting them in these different ways. You're getting stronger, um, but you're losing ductility, right? You are destroying your spherulites. Remember, the spherulites are the crystalline regions. They get destroyed. Um, and if you take this sample, if you take this one right here, and you throw it back in a furnace, then what's going to happen? Well, right now, you've increased the order of the system, but, but you can make it more disordered by allowing these amorphous regions to curl back together and by forming again. So you'll actually recover back to something similar to your initial structure if you heat treat it. Okay? So... What are some factors that we should look at? Something to be aware of when you deform polymers is that they are very susceptible to creep over time, right? If you started out right here and you can go through these steps and end up like that over time, then that would be creep. Something to be aware of with mechanical properties of polymers and deformation of polymers is stress relaxation. When you initially take a polymer and you stretch it, it will be under a certain stress load, but it will creep over time. These polymer chains will align, they will stretch, and eventually the load inside your material will be reduced. That is stress relaxation. And it can be modeled with this equation right here. So you can see that the stress at any given time is equal to your initial stress, that's sigma naught, times the exponential of negative E times T, that's your modulus, negative modulus times time, divided by the viscosity of your material. Let's do an example problem of this. It says, um, at the glassy transition temperature, you observe a stress of 100 megapascal produces 10% strain. What does this, this stress decay to after two minutes? Give your answer in megapascals to one decimal place. All right, to solve this equation, we need to know the modulus. Well, fortunately, we know that stress equals modulus times strain, and we're told that 100 megapascals produced 10% strain, Therefore, the modulus is given right there. It's going to be 1 gigapascal, or 1,000 megapascals, right? 1,000 megapascals, all right? Next step, we can go ahead and plug this in. The stress at any given time, right, is going to be equal to our initial stress, 100 megapascals, multiplied by the exponential of negative our modulus. Let's go ahead and put this in pascals, so it's negative 1,000 e to the sixth pascals divided by, or multiplied by time, divided by our viscosity. And it said this is happening at the glassy transition temperature. So we know what the viscosity is. It's 10 to the 12th pascal seconds. Let's go ahead and put our time in as seconds so that the units cancel out here. So it said two minutes. So that's going to be 60 times two. That will give us uh, the number of seconds here. So when I plug all this into my calculator, I find that it has a value of 88.7 megapascals. So that stress, you initially stress that polymer to 100 megapascals, that's the load that's on it. Two minutes later, it's already down to, you know, 10% less, right? It's down to 88.7. Um, so this is stress relaxation. Obviously, the higher the temperature you're at, where the viscosity gets lower and lower, then you can have an even faster drop-off, right? It's in the exponential. So this is something to be aware of. Uh, now, 
Polymers are complicated, so lots of factors can influence uh, their mechanical properties and their deformation. For example, molecular weight. How would this change it? Modulus is relatively unaffected with molecular weight. might increase a little bit. But the tensile strength does increase with molecular weight. Right? The tensile strength will increase because longer chains uh, have more uh, likelihood of being entangled. Right? Higher molecular weight means longer chains. Longer chains tangle up more. If they're more tangled, then you're going to have to break covalent bonds right? eventually to untangle them. And then degree of crystallinity. So secondary bonding prevents um, or prevalent. So secondary bonding is prevalent in these crystalline regions, right? And so that leads to higher modulus, right? Because they're going to be stacked up better, so they're going to be more stiff. And then tensile strength as well, but it will become more brittle. Something to have in mind is this. If you were to plot crystallinity versus molecular weight, what would you get, right? So crystallinity, molecular weight. So if this is like 500, we'll do 5K, 50K, something like that. What you might expect polymers to behave like is this, right? As you move towards higher molecular weights, polymers exist in this blue band here, right? So here you would have down here your greases and your liquid. So low crystallinity, low molecular weight, it's probably going to be a liquid like gasoline, right? Gasoline is a low molecular weight polymer, so it's going to be down here. It's going to be a grease or a liquid, not surprisingly. As you increase the crystallinity, even at these relatively low molecular weights, that's where you get waxes, but these are soft waxes. As you now move towards higher molecular weights in higher crystallinities, uh, the highest will be your brittle waxes. So you get brittle wax up here if you're really crystalline. Here you get hard waxes or tough waxes. Okay, right there. And then finally out there at really high molecular weights and above, this is where you get your engineering plastics, right? Your uh, hard and soft plastics. All right. Oftentimes with polymers, they make them in a melt, and then they draw them out as fibers, right? So when you draw out polymers, we know what happens. You're aligning these chains. You're basically strengthening it in that direction, right? You do see a strengthening. You, you do see an analog to strain hardening. It produces highly oriented fibers, highly anisotropic properties, right? A rope, a climbing rope, has all these fibers mostly lined up like that. So if you were to pull on it this way, you get very different properties than if you pull on it like that. Right, so it's highly anisotropic. Okay, uh, in fact, right here it shows like at a 45 angle off of orientation, your modulus drops by a factor of five. Even just like at 45 degrees off, you see this massive reduction, right, in your modulus. Um, it says if drawn at high temperatures, it must be quenched rapidly to retain its drawn properties. Right, so if you're drawing this at a high temperature, if you want to retain that, then you've got to quench it quickly because if you hold it at high temperatures, it basically it would rather turn back into this, right? So if you want to prevent that, then you need to cool it down quickly. Um, if you do heat treat it, it's going to go back to uh, a more disordered structure. You're going to form something like spherolites, crystalline sections, separated by amorphous regions. That's what will happen if you heat treat it. So imagine what that will do to your mechanical properties, right? If the sample was undrawn, then heating it will both increase ductility and strength. Right, but if you've drawn your polymer, if it went, if it's drawn, then you had this really high strength in this scenario where it's vertical, but you lose that strength if you uh, heat treat it afterwards. Right. Now, what about deformation of elastomers, things like rubbers that are cross-linked? Well, an unstressed elastomer is amorphous, coiled, twisted, or kinked. Okay. Now, an elastic deformation is going to be the uncoiling, untwisting, or straightening of that polymer. Right. So as that happens, you can imagine that your modulus was increased, right? As you straighten things out and they start to line up, you're giving it bonding. And so you're going to see an increase in your stiffness, right? And this is sort of opposite what you'd expect with other polymers, right? Because um, remember, to be an elastomer, you cannot be crystalline. The chain bonds rotate freely. Plastic deformation must be delayed, right, via cross-linking. 
and then you're typically at temperatures above the glassy transition temperature, right? Um, final thing is we've talked about vulcanization before, but if you introduce some sort of side group that can bond different polymer chains together, so now they're stuck together, um, that is vulcanization. It was done with sulfur, with uh, latex rubber, with the first sort of rubber that Charles Goodyear invented. But now there's lots of different ways to cross-link materials, uh, polymers. In fact, you can even do ionic cross-linking where you don't have to break a covalent bond, you break an ionic one. And this has allowed us to make really cool things like self-healing rubber, right? You can split the rubber, but all you did was split an ionic bond. So when you touch it back together again, that charge difference causes it to rebond again. And now you can have tires in that, which imagine uh, just putting it back together and having it heal. There's some nuances with it, um, but there are companies commercializing this right now. Anyways, uh, so that's deformation of polymers.